I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's December 15th, and we have a lot to talk about. And because it's December 15th, Some of you may be feeling some of the stress and anxiety that seems to come with the holiday season. And honestly, this holiday season, who could even blame you? Because if the holidays aren't enough, this year we're also going through what's looking like the worst part of the COVID-19 pandemic. Stress and anxiety aren't guaranteed, but they aren't exactly unexpected either. That's why my guest this week is Megan Weigel. And Megan is here to share some techniques and strategies that we can use to de-stress during the holidays. And these strategies will still be part of your self-care toolbox long after the holidays have come and gone. Megan is a nurse practitioner specializing in neurological care. And Megan brings a unique integrative medicine and holistic nursing perspective to her practice, First Coast Integrative Medicine, in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. She's been a nurse practitioner for over 20 years and a multiple sclerosis certified nurse since 2005. Megan is also a board certified advanced practice holistic nurse. But before we get to my conversation with Megan Weigel, there are a few other things that you should know about. In last week's episode of the podcast, we talked about the successful outcome of a study involving mesenchymal stem cell transplantation among people living with progressive MS. I want to add to that report and let you know that that specific treatment, which was developed at Israel's Hadassah Medical Center, has already been licensed and is being further developed by a company called Neurogenesis. So we're sure to be hearing more about that particular stem cell therapy in the new year. Last week, I also mentioned that I felt pretty certain we'd be hearing more news about stem cell clinical trials, but I just didn't know that we'd be hearing it quite so soon. Last week, a research team at Vilnius University in Lithuania reported the outcome of a clinical trial evaluating the efficacy of autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or AHSCT. This study involved 24 people with highly active relapsing-remitting MS who all failed to respond to more conventional disease-modifying therapies. Of the 24 participants, 13 completed the full two-year follow-up after receiving their stem cell transplantation. And from this group, one person had one MS relapse during the first year after AHSCT, and three people had one relapse during the second year following AHSCT. Additionally, about 84% of the patients showed improvement in their EDSS score six months after the stem cell transplant. 77% showed improvement one year after the transplant. And 77% of those patients continued to show stable disability scores two years after receiving the stem cell transplant. Improvements in cognition were also observed, and no new or active lesions were found on MRI after the stem cell transplant, leaving 100% of the patients without any radiological evidence of disease activity. Finally, the procedure proved to be safe. Now, this is also reflective of a small pilot study. As the research team commented, outcomes are very promising and further research is needed to replicate these findings and to assess long-term outcomes and safety of AHSCT. And I can guarantee that we'll see that additional research taking place as larger trials are launched. I'll also add that just a few weeks ago, the National MS Society's National Medical Advisory Committee published their recommendation of AHSCT. Now, this recommendation comes with several specific caveats, and if you're interested in reviewing the details of the MS Society's recommendation, please be sure to check out episode number 166 of Real Talk MS, and you'll find a link to that episode 
as well as a link to the new study results from the Vilnius University research team in today's show notes. Perhaps one positive takeaway from the COVID-19 pandemic has been the almost instant adoption of telemedicine. Providing patients with an opportunity to receive health care without taking on the sometimes challenging task of getting to an appointment has proven to be beneficial to so many people across the country, and it's allowed healthcare providers to extend their reach and provide care where otherwise it wouldn't be logistically possible. Even after the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, we can expect that telemedicine will remain a part of our healthcare delivery system. So, a few months ago, the National MS Society convened a working group of experts to establish guidance for people living with MS so that they could easily and confidently navigate a telemedicine appointment. This document demystifies telemedicine, explains what it is, points out what you'll need to connect, and how you should best prepare for a telemedicine appointment. If you'd like to review the MS Society's telemedicine guidance, you'll find a link in today's show notes. And if you've already downloaded the free Real Talk MS app from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, well, you'll find your copy of the new guidance document under the bonus content tab. Although there are a number of different computer-based cognitive rehabilitation tools to treat cognitive dysfunction in MS, the research on their overall effectiveness has not shown any clear winners. A research team at the University of Bologna in Italy believed that the reason there are no clear winners is that these computer-based tools have been designed to treat cognitive disability in general, while there are very specific aspects of cognitive impairment in MS that must be addressed if a therapy is going to be effective. To test their hypothesis, the team created a computerized tool called MS Rehab that was designed to focus on the specific cognitive features that are most relevant to MS. The team tested their new tool on a small group of eight people living with MS between the ages of 18 and 72 who were experiencing mild disability. The study participants were given a battery of tests to measure their cognitive ability at the beginning and at the end of the study, and the study results showed significant improvement in verbal comprehension, working memory, processing speed, and overall mental status while showing lower levels of depression among the participants. The study participants all expressed a willingness to continue using the new tool, and they also provided some useful feedback to the research team, suggesting they make the text larger and that they optimize the interface for larger screens. Armed with an encouraging outcome from this pilot study, the research team is hoping to confirm their findings in a larger study. And if you'd like to review the details of this pilot study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. Researchers at Montclair State University and Kessler Foundation have received funding from the National MS Society to investigate how memory-related cognitive processes are altered by MS. The four-year study is titled Neuroimaging of Hippocampally Mediated Memory Dysfunction in Multiple Sclerosis. And the study is going to use advanced neuroimaging studies to help the investigators understand how changes in working memory and structural changes in the part of the brain called the hippocampus may contribute to memory problems that affect people living with MS. The hope is that once scientists have a clear understanding of memory loss in MS, it's going to lead to effective interventions for restoring lost function. And we'll be following this study as it gets underway. Throughout the year, we've talked about treating MS symptoms like pain or spasticity with CBD or cannabidiol-based products. And while there are studies that have shown CBD to be effective in managing MS pain and spasticity, purchasing the right CBD products remains very challenging for consumers. 
Now, there's a science-based, peer-reviewed website called Leaf Report that's been established to help consumers navigate the confusing landscape of CBD products. And Leaf Report teamed up with Canalysis Laboratories to test 40 different CBD edible products. And they found that the product labels, which are the things that most consumers look at in selecting a CBD edible, well, these product labels were highly inaccurate. The lab found that only one in every four edible products contain the amount of CBD published on the label. The amount of CBD in 75% of the edible products tested was off by anywhere from 11% to 177% when it was compared with what was on the product label. The companies with the most accurate product labels tended to be newer, smaller companies, while more established brands were actually rated the worst. This is a real-world example of the risks associated with navigating an unregulated market. Hopefully, we'll see the appropriate levels of oversight and regulation applied to the cannabis market in the near future so that consumers don't have to worry about what it is that they're actually purchasing and using. If you'd like to review Leaf Report's findings, I'll include a link in today's show notes. Investigators at the University of Washington and the University of Michigan are recruiting adults living with MS to participate in a study called Combo MS, comparing the effectiveness of three different forms of treatment for MS fatigue. Some people in the study will be given ProVigil, which is a popular pharmacological therapy for fatigue related to sleep disorders. Some people in the study will receive a form of psychotherapy called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT. And some people in the study will receive a combination of both ProVigil therapy and CBT. Participants in the study will receive this treatment for about three months and then be followed for an additional three months. The study is open to adults over the age of 18 with all types of MS, who have experienced chronic fatigue that has interfered with their ability to perform normal daily life activities for at least three months. All aspects of this study, including screening, treatment, and completing four surveys, all of it can be performed remotely, either by phone, video conference, or online. None of it will require study participants to travel. Study participants will also be eligible to receive up to $300 in compensation for their participation in the study. Fatigue affects more than 80% of the people living with MS, and as we've discussed in previous episodes, there isn't a really outstanding treatment for MS fatigue. So this is important work. The research team is looking to enroll about 330 people in this study, and if you'd like to participate, the first step is to complete an online survey to assess your eligibility. The survey will take between 5 and 10 minutes to complete, and you'll find a link to this survey in today's show notes. When you're living with MS, it can sometimes be challenging to gain support from the people around you. You might be struggling with symptoms that are invisible, or you may not have even disclosed your diagnosis yet. But it can make a huge difference when you actually connect with someone who gets it. And that person is just a phone call away. The National MS Society offers a program called MS Friends. And MS Friends connects you with volunteers who are living with MS. The volunteers for MS Friends complete a rigorous screening and training program. And they are all about focusing on the needs of those who reach out to them for support. Your conversations with MS Friends volunteers are confidential and they're convenient. And while this program is not intended to provide crisis support, you'll be connecting with someone who knows firsthand what it's like to live with MS. And very often, just making that connection with someone who intuitively understands, well, that can make a huge difference. To connect with MS Friends, you just have to call 866 673 7436. That's 866-MS-FRIEND. You can call seven days a week.
from 9 a.m. to midnight Eastern Time. I'll include that phone number in today's show notes, and I want to thank Jim Liberty for suggesting that we talk about MS Friends. Jim is a member of the Real Talk MS community, and he's an MS Friends volunteer. You know, having an informal conversation with someone who really gets it is one way to practice self-care. And while self-care is always important, it's particularly important when you're trying to manage the stress and anxiety which seem to come along with the holiday season, not to mention the added anxiety that accompanies a global pandemic. And joining me to help us navigate through the stress and strain of the 2020 holiday season is Megan Weigel. Megan is a nurse practitioner specializing in neurological care, a multiple sclerosis certified nurse, and a board-certified advanced practice holistic nurse. So Megan brings a very unique perspective to her practice. In a moment, we'll meet my guest, Megan Weigel. The holiday season brings with it its own set of stresses and anxieties. Throw in a global pandemic that seems to be surging in places all over the world, and even if you aren't among those people living with MS who have been diagnosed with depression, this holiday season will be emotionally challenging for a lot of people. And that's why we're talking with my guest, Megan Weigel. Megan is a nurse practitioner specializing in neurological care, and Megan brings a unique integrative medicine and holistic nursing perspective to her practice, First Coast Integrative Medicine, in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. She's been a nurse practitioner for over 20 years and a multiple sclerosis certified nurse since 2005. Megan is also a board-certified advanced practice holistic nurse. Welcome to the podcast, Megan. Thanks, John. I'm happy to be here. When I just introduced you, I pointed out that you bring an integrative medicine and holistic nursing perspective to your practice. So I think a good place for us to start is by asking you to explain what those terms are all about and how bringing that unique perspective to your practice helps people living with MS. Sure thing, and, and I always appreciate the question, so thanks for asking. Um, integrative medicine is, is really a healing-oriented medicine, so a basic tenet of it maintains that healing is possible even when a cure is not. Um, and, and so when, when you just kind of take off this, um, this big elephant off the table, <laughs> um, you can empower people who have chronic conditions um, to really take the wheels of their life back. And integrative medicine does that using conventional medicine, the science under which I was trained, and also uh, complementary and alternative uh, methods that um, help treat the whole patient, mind, body, spirit. Let's get into today's topic. What is it yeah. that makes the holidays so stressful for so many people? I mean, I think most of us are living with a pretty full plate, no matter what our deal is. And when you, you know, bring the holidays in, you bring in a plate that's full of holiday traditions that you can't give up because somebody's going to get mad at you. Maybe um, you bring in well, I don't know this year, but, you know, gatherings, parties, traveling, um, you bring in uh, cooking, wrapping, buying, financial issues and concerns, our schedules become tighter, we sleep less to do all this stuff, and then we eat Christmas cookies for breakfast. <laughs> I think I think you've covered it, yes. And, and, and this year, you know, it's not just the typical holiday stress. It, it can no. be the atypical but very real stress and anxiety caused by the COVID-19 pandemic that people are actually feeling. You know, for some, the pandemic means rethinking those holiday plans and traditions. For others, it's the fear of contracting the virus. And for others, it's struggling with the virus itself or, or even mourning the loss of a loved one who's no longer there to celebrate the holidays. That, that is a lot of extra, and, and none of it sounds very positive. What are some things that people can do to get through the holiday season while they're also getting through a global pandemic? I would encourage people to focus on joy. Um, so instead of focusing on how many things can I do to please everyone else, I would focus on you know, the top three to five things that bring you and your family joy and just do those. 
Um, it's so important. It's it's just so easy right now to become overwhelmed with anxiety and negativity. Um, and the, the only way that we can block that stuff out is with literally positive action. We have to do it. We have to bring the joy in. We have to turn off the news when it causes us to be anxious. Um, so with, with the holidays and the pandemic causing us to maybe not be able to access joy like we like to, for example, traveling, parties, um, you know, set up things with your friends and family that are virtual so that you still have a, a chance for connection. I notice that a lot of people tend to recognize stress retroactively once that stressful episode is in the rearview mirror. I think it can sometimes be hard for someone to slow down and recognize that they're being stressed out in real time. So maybe you can help us understand some of the common signs of stress that we want to be aware of. Some of the common signs of stress are actually more physical than mental. So often we pick up things in our bodies and then we realize, oh, maybe that's from anxiety or maybe that's because I'm stressed out. And some of those things are tension across your forehead, tension headaches, um, neck and shoulder pain and tension, um, heartburn, chest discomfort, not the kind that, you know, sends you to the ER, <laughs> um, but but things that that you recognize, gosh, this has happened before. The last time I tried to do too much, I had heartburn or my belly hurt or I got constipated. Um, sometimes dizziness. Um, all of these things can go along with stress. And it's kind of helpful to, as we approach the holidays, to think back to, you know, maybe last year or other times when a person was stressed out and say, how did I feel in my body then? And what was the cause? So maybe you can prevent it moving forward. Well, speaking about stress affecting our bodies physically, how does it impact multiple sclerosis? Yeah, so major personal stressors um, have been associated with enhancing lesions in MS and new T2 lesions, so new MS plaques. Um, Long-term stress actually changes the way the immune system works. So it does cause, like we see in MS, that shift from an anti-inflammatory to a pro-inflammatory environment. Those changes in lesion burden may not show up as a relapse, but over time, we know that more lesions equals worse MS. So we'd really, we'd really like to prevent those from happening. That's why it's so important to learn how to manage stress. Well, we've all heard that one of the very nice byproducts of exercise is that it causes your body to produce those endorphins that can <laughs> elevate our mood. It, it also, exercise also reduces levels of stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. So yep. be besides all of the other evidence-based reasons for someone with MS to incorporate exercise into their regular routine, it sounds like we should be thinking about incorporating exercise especially during the holiday season to offset some of those added stresses. Good idea? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, people may put exercise, which is a form of self-care or any self-care on the back burner right now because they have so many other things to get done. Um, but at the end of the day, your family isn't going to remember how beautiful, um, you know, the cake was. Uh, they're going to remember that mom was grumpy on the day that they were celebrating because she didn't do her self-care or dad um, was tired because, you know, he didn't get to do his exercise that morning. So I highly encourage people to put that first, especially right now during the holiday season. It actually can improve your energy if you're doing it the right way, living with MS. So while we're thinking about self-care, what about things like meditation and mindfulness are these things that can help reduce stress levels and and sometimes those terms are used interchangeably but are there differences between meditation and mindfulness yes so mindfulness is actually the act of being 100 percent present with what you're doing at any given time. Um, that could be, you know, us being here on the podcast together without looking at phones and watches and emails, messages, whatever. Um, it could be taking a walk outside um, or taking a ride outside and, and paying attention to the environment, not worrying about your to-do list. 
meditation is a form of mindfulness or, or a mindfulness based activity. And both of these, um, both of these activities have been shown to be beneficial in MS for anxiety and pain and even for fatigue. Um, so I, I do highly recommend these, um, even if you just adapt uh, a breathing technique um, that helps slow down your breathing and your heart rate, you're doing yourself a really big favor from the standpoint of stress. Well, since we're talking about meditation, I've heard you might be convinced to take us through a short meditation to, to let us better understand how it works and, and see how, how really easy it is to incorporate. Yeah, I'd love to. We'll do, we'll do a short one so people really can understand how easy it is to change the way you feel in your mind and your body. So just get comfortable wherever you are um, sitting or laying down right now. Um, and you want to be in a state of relaxed alertness. So close your eyes, um, relax your shoulders, relax your forehead, let your hands open up towards the ceiling or the sky, let your hips and your feet relax, and begin, begin to breathe in a little more slowly and deeply than usual. So you're breathing in through your nose, and out through your nose. And now call to mind an experience that caused you to feel joy, care, appreciation, or love. And regenerate all of the emotions around that experience. Continue to breathe in slowly and deeply as you relive that experience in your mind's eye. And as you let yourself be enveloped by those positive emotions, that care, that love or appreciation in your body. Maybe you feel a warm sensation behind your heart, or maybe you feel your body relax a little bit more. Take a deep breath in and let that feeling, let that good feeling just root in you as you exhale. Take another deep breath in through your nose and then open your mouth and sigh, ha. And when you're, uh, when you're ready, you can open your eyes, wiggle your fingers, and um, know that you can call that to mind anywhere, right? You can do that at a red light without closing your eyes. <laughs> I, I feel like I've just come out of a six-hour nap. So <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, you know, when people meditate for the first time, I sometimes do like a 10 minute medicate meditation and everyone thinks that it's only been two minutes. They're amazed that they could actually sit still that long. We're talking about holiday stress and anxiety. Something that kind of runs parallel to it is holiday depression, not uncommon at all. How can people best kind of tease out the differences to know whether they're dealing with depression versus the stress and anxiety that the holidays create? Yeah, this is hard. Um, and I think there are different types of people, right? So stress kind of comes into our lives and there are people who run a little, let's say they run a little bit hotter, like they tend toward agitation, anxiety, mind racing. And then there are people who run a little bit colder and they tend to withdraw. Um, sometimes they go hand in hand. In fact, a lot of times they go hand in hand. Um, but depression is typically associated with sleep changes, either too many, too much or too little, uh, loss of interest in things that used to make you really happy, feelings of hopelessness or worthlessness. And that's kind of the biggie 
uh, that may not happen with anxiety, um, lack of energy, trouble with um, concentrating, uh, trouble with cognition that would be different than if you were having that already living with MS, um, changes in appetite, feeling clumsy or klutzy, and then thoughts about death or dying. And it doesn't have to be a suicidal thought. It could just be like a morbid preoccupation. Oh, I better, you know, get things cleaned up in my house because what if I die or, you know, just very preoccupation with death, either yourself or someone else's. And when should someone see a professional about stress and anxiety they may be feeling? I really have a low threshold for recommending mental health counseling to people. Um, I think it's just kind of, it's all the things that we were supposed to learn in kindergarten that didn't sink in. <laughs> um, so I, I think that if you're feeling those emotions, even at a low level, you know, they may not be affecting your life every day, but, you know, every so often they are. I think it's important to get help. Now, if you're experiencing those symptoms every day for two weeks or more, then you pretty much could meet a clinical diagnosis of depression and should call a healthcare provider, um, either your neurologist, your primary care doctor, um, or you can even call uh, an MS navigator from the National MS Society to find a mental health professional near you. Um, if you are having suicidal thoughts, there are suicide prevention hotlines that are available. Uh, mental Health America and SAMHSA both have um, suicide prevention hotlines that are helpful uh, for people in crisis. Uh, Megan Weigel, thank you for all that you do to improve the quality of life for people affected by MS. Thank you for helping us de-stress and make the most of this holiday season. And thanks for talking with me today. Thanks so much, John. It's an honor to be here. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 172. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. I don't think that I have to tell anyone listening to this podcast that the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified and in some cases multiplied the challenges of living with MS. More than ever before, people living with MS need access to reliable information, support, and connection. We're witnessing that even during a pandemic, MS doesn't stop. And neither does the National MS Society. With vital funding from supporters like you, the National MS Society is continuing to meet the urgent and expanding needs of the MS community during these unprecedented times while ensuring that the MS research community rebounds quickly from COVID-19 so that the progress and momentum toward finding a cure continues. That's why I hope that as you're able, you'll make a donation to the Society's COVID-19 Response Fund. It couldn't be easier. Just text the word GIVE to 68686, and you'll get a link right to the MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. I hope you'll consider contributing today, because it's never been more important. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices. <laughs>